It has been said that for every action there is a what? For every action there is a reaction. For every decision there is a consequence. And what you do and what I do and the decisions that we make in our lives and every action that, that we initiate in our lives, it matters. It makes a, dir- a, a difference. It, it can impact our lives. Decisions and choices impact the lives of people around us. Uh, it can be even things that have spiritual consequences, spiritual reactions, and even, I believe, there are eternal ramifications that are at play in the things that we do in our lives. So you matter, your decisions matter, and maybe even some of us today are are faced with tremendous decisions and things that are coming up in our life, or even as actions are happening around us, we're coming to realize that our reaction, our reaction to those actions are really important too. As important as it is for believers, to pray, uh, to study, uh, to share their hearts with others, to share the love of Christ, uh, to engage with one another in the body of Christ. As important as those things are and as as huge as they might be in the lives of other people. I do not want us today in John chapter 15 to necessarily confuse all of that with what Jesus is trying to express in John chapter 15, because in all honesty, so many times those things get brought into John chapter 15. And when it comes to questions about abiding in Christ, are you abiding in Christ? Bearing fruit, are you bearing fruit? So many times those things, which are really, really important in and of themselves, they get brought into this biblical text, these words of Christ. And sometimes it can get really, really confusing Instead of walking away from John 15, some people will walk away and they'll feel stressed. They'll feel burdened. Uh, They might feel like uh, they don't have much rest in the Lord. Uh, They might lose their joy because they become very, very concerned with the question, am I abiding? Am I abiding today? Will I abide tomorrow? Will I not abide? Am I bearing fruit today? Will I bear fruit tomorrow? If I don't abide today, if I don't bear fruit, what's going to happen to me based on the words of Jesus here? So over the last three weeks, including today, we've been working through this really important teaching of Jesus. And in this series, we have looked at the truth of what it means to abide in Christ. Now, this can be taught about three different ways. And many times it's been taught that to abide in Christ means that the Christian is to strive to do certain things on a continual basis. And if they don't, then they're not abiding and they're not bearing fruit. And then if that's true, there is a risk that they're not bearing fruit is going to result in them being discarded and burned as if a perilous judgment awaits believers who don't abide. Hopefully, when we conclude today, you'll see that there is a very, very, very simple message in John chapter 15. It truly is black and white. There is not a lot of gray here when you really work through it. And we'll come to a basic question today. And if you're taking notes, they're on the back of your bulletin, a place that you can take notes. This series is simply entitled, I Abide. And it's part three in this message series. And hopefully we'll come to one very simple question that you'll ask yourself today. And it'll be this. Am I really in Christ or not? Am I really in Christ or not. Like I said, this has been taught one of about three different ways. Some take the words of John chapter 15 and they say, this is written or Jesus said these 
these words to people who had already made a commitment to follow him, Christians. And then the Christian is admonished to abide in Christ by certain things that he or she says or does. Then, if the Christian will abide in Christ, then the Christian will have a hope of bearing fruit. Then you come to verse 6. In verse 6, Jesus simply says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are what? And they are what? They are burned. And so people say, well, well, I better get busy about abiding, and I better get busy about bearing fruit. And the Christian, if the Christian does not do those things, then a perilous judgment awaits the Christian. A judgment will come. They're going to be cast away, and they're going to be burned. And this is speaking of damnation. This is speaking of an eternal fire that waits them. This is a judgment that if they don't abide and bear fruit, then bad things are coming their way. Others will come at it and say, yeah, all this is to the Christian, yes. But when you get to verse 6, this basically means that the believer at this point is useless. That Jesus isn't necessarily saying that the believer is going to lose their salvation, but he's saying the Christian is useless. And what do you do with useless branches? With useless branches... Well, you just gather them up and, and you, you set them on fire, but that doesn't mean eternal fire or damnation or judgment in hell. It just means that you're useless and, and, and the, your life on this earth is not going to end very good, which is a real strain on the biblical text to arrive at that conclusion. But could it be that there is a much simpler approach to this passage of Scripture and that's what we're exploring and looking at, and I believe there is, and that this passage of Scripture is written to people in general. It's written to people in general. And there is a possibility that even in the audience of Jesus at this point in time, that there were people who've yet to come to make a decision for Christ. That they are not in Christ yet. And so for those who are not in Christ yet, the invitation is, Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Abide in Christ. Because the word abide simply means to live in or to be connected to. This is not written to those who are already in Him per se, but it's an invitation for people in general to come to faith in Christ. And if you don't come to faith in Christ, then you need to be concerned about a perilous judgment and the story for you not ending very well at all. There's things that support this throughout Scripture that I want to bring to your attention today. For those who would say, this is a warning to believers who are already in Jesus that you better get busy about abiding and you better start bearing fruit or a perilous judgment is going to come, we would simply share with them John chapter 5, verse 24. It's important that we look at John and what John has to say because who's the author? Who's recording these words of Christ? It's John. We'll also bring to your attention today a writing from a writing from 1 John. It's, it's the same author. And we're not saying that all of Scripture is not congruent and it doesn't complement one another. We're just simply suggesting that if you're looking for the most congruent thought, then look to the same author. Because as much as we might misunderstand what one is saying over the next, you can at least expect the same author to be saying the same thing. In John chapter 5, verse 24, John writes, and he simply says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and does what? Remember what Jesus said at the beginning of John chapter 15 to begin with? In verse 3, 
He says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. That apparently there were those who were there who had accepted his word and had believed in his word. He says specifically, you are already clean. Why were they already clean? Because they were bearing fruit. They were bearing fruit already. And the common life principle that Jesus laid out here is a branch that is not connected to the vine cannot do what? It cannot simply bear fruit. But for those who have been cleansed or pruned, he says those are the ones that have borne fruit. So the question about abiding is not with them. It's already happening in those specific ones' lives. So he says in John 5, 24 earlier, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not what? Just in case I've lost somebody over the last few moments. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Not will have, not hope to have, but has. Possesses eternal life right now. If you have heard the word of Christ and you have believed in faith, you have eternal life right now. It is not a hope so. It's not a maybe. It is a certainty of your life. You do not get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life the moment you profess faith in Jesus. And then he says this, which is really important to one of the views that's been taught in regards to John 15. And not only do you have eternal life, but he who believes does not come into what? Does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. So that statement in verse 6 is not for the one who is in Christ. Because the one who is in Christ never has to fear or worry about God taking them out and burning them. God does not do that to His children. Some people ask the question, so if abiding in Christ is simply for those who accept Jesus, then what does it mean to abide? How can I know? How can I know? 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. And when I came across this about two months ago or a month and a half ago, this is what sealed the deal for me. That this is written as a general invitation for people to come to faith in Christ. Not written to be a scare tactic for those who are already in Christ as a warning of what will happen if they don't abide and if they don't bear fruit, whether it's eternal judgment or they become useless in this life. It's what John says in 1 John. Chapter 4, verse 15, ask the question, what does it mean to abide? Who abides? Listen to this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, and what we would do at this point is just turn the question to us today. Have you? Have you come to a point in your life where you have been confronted with the person of Jesus, the claims about Jesus, what He did on a cross when He died, what happened when He rose from, from the dead? Have you yourself been confronted with the person of Jesus? Have, have you thought about Jesus? Have, have you taken serious reflection upon Jesus and who He 
said he was and what he did uh, and, and what he said he accomplished and what the biblical writers have said he accomplished. Have you come face to face with Jesus and what have you done with him? What have you done with him? You might say, well, I'm still thinking about it. I'm still processing and pondering. Some of you are going, you know what? Years and years ago, and I'll never forget when I was nine years old, being confronted with what Jesus did for me, and kneeling in prayer, and, and even though my understanding was still limited in terms of the big picture of everything that's going on, with the sincerest of heart that I had at the time, surrendered my life to Him. And I'll tell you this too. There have been times where in my life where if I did question and I did wonder, I'd go back to that place in time. And over the years as I've gone back to that place in time, it becomes very, very vivid to me that even though I did not understand there, all there is to know, with the sincerest of heart, I said yes to Jesus in my life. And I go back to that. And I go back to that. And I go back to that. It's been really, really important to me that I go back to that. So the question is very simple. Have you? 1 John 4.15. This is what sealed the deal for me on how you approach John 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, have you done that? Have you not done that? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, and, and this is what is implied in the text, and it's, it's explicit in the text. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God does what? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God does what? God abides in Him. And here's what is so beautiful about true Christianity. What is so beautiful about true Christianity is that when I surrendered my heart to Jesus, I wasn't so much making a commitment to Him as I was accepting a commitment He makes to me. It wasn't so much of a commitment that I was making to Him. But I was accepting a commitment He was making to me. He who began a what? He who began a good work is faithful to do what? Is faithful to complete it. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him. And Jesus had said in John 14, and this is in John 15, it's before the cross. It's before the resurrection. It's before Pentecost. So the hope of, of this eternal abiding of the Spirit in us was to come. It was to come. They hadn't experienced it yet. So in John chapter 14, Jesus says in John chapter 14, when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth comes to you, He will abide with you for how long? He will abide with you forever. Which means this. When it comes to abiding in Christ, there is no coming in and going out. There's no coming in. There's no going out. There's no coming in. I'm abiding today, but I'm not abiding tomorrow. I'm abiding this morning, but I'm not abiding tonight. It's not a coming in and a going out, a coming in and a going out, and that's not to say. That there's not times or seasons of my life that I am more aware of His Spirit in my life than other times. That's not also to say that there's times of my life I feel like and I sense that the Spirit does things through my life in ways that He doesn't at other times. But here's the beauty of even that. Most of the time when the Spirit is working vibrantly in our lives, when He is most conscientious of working through us, it's typically when we are least conscientious of Him doing that in our lives. In other words, so many times He works in and through us and we're not even aware of it. 
And it's a good thing. Amen. It's probably a really, really good thing because if that was the case, then we'd start handing out medals and awards and start patting ourselves on the back and all glory be to us. He says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. And look at this next part. And he. He does what? God abides in him and he in God. Are you in Christ? Or are you not in Christ? If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, then you're in him. You're in him. Then you're in him. John 15 is really about what we call spiritual geography. Spiritual geography is who are you in? If you are not in Christ, you are still in Adam and in your sin. If you are in Christ, then you're in the Son of God and you're in righteousness. It's spiritual geography. Are you in Him? Or are you not in Him? And once you're in Him, and He's in you, you'll never have to worry about a time that He's not in you, or you're not in Him, no matter what you're going through in your life. So what's the fruit? Well, so many times when we think about the fruit, and I do want to bring this to your attention real quick in verse 6, okay? Just real quick. Watch this. This, this is another aspect of this that sealed the deal for me. Look at verse 6 of John chapter 15. Let's read this together. In John 15, verse 6, he says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown, as a, thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Notice what the text does not say. The text does not say, If anyone does not bear fruit. See, for those who would teach that there's a perilous judgment that comes to the believer, whether it's a uselessness on this earth and God takes you out, or it's damnation in hell. Many times it's taught like this. If you do not, if you do not what? If you do not bear fruit, then you have to be concerned about that. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus doesn't say, if anyone does not bear fruit. It's not to the believer and to what happens in their life after accepting Christ. He says, no, it's not if anyone does not bear fruit. The, the thing that Jesus says is, anyone that does not what? Y'all see that in the text. Anyone that does not what? Anyone that does not what? Anyone that does not abide. And to abide simply means to live in or to be connected to Jesus. Do you live in Him or not? If you live in Him, you abide. If you don't, then you're not abiding, and that's when your life falls apart. And that's when your eternity falls apart, because it's a matter of being in Jesus or not in Jesus. Confessing Him or not confessing Him. See, it really is black or white. Fruit. So many times people say, well, it's this action, it's that action. If you do this, then that's fruit. If you do that, it's fruit. And so many times people point to certain actions in a believer's life, and they say, these are the fruits. This is the fruit. I think the text also tells us what the fruit is. What the fruit is. And Jesus did say, you know, you shall know them by their fruit. So what's the fruit? You look down in the text. And let's go to verse 9. Because I think that's the big clue. Just as the Father has what? The words of Jesus. Just as the Father has what? Loved me. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. 
Again, that needs to be factored into what these disciples understood as the commandments of Christ. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Jesus is the perfect picture of the life that abides. These things I have spoken to you, verse 11, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment that you do what? That you love one another just as I have loved you in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. You ask the question, what is truly fruit? The fruit must be love. As good as various things are in the believer's life, in terms of prayer, Bible study, witnessing, engaging in the church body, serving, using your spiritual gifts, as good as they are, as important as they are, they're never to be mistaken as the true fruit. The true fruit is that which is, can only be measured in a person's heart. And it seems to be love. Love. Very simply, love. It's love. And we place a premium on so many things. And as good as those things are, there is nothing that beats love. Galatians 5. I think it's kind of where Paul starts with all of this anyway. When you start thinking about the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, there in Galatians 5, Beginning in verse 16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want. The things that you want. What are the things you want to do? If you are truly in Christ, the things that you want to do are the things that line up with His heart. That's the true desire of your life. If you are, in, listen to me, if you are in Christ, we do not have to compel or beg or force anyone to do the things that are nearest to the heart of Christ. Because if you are in Christ, you're a new creation in Christ, you are a partaker of the divine nature, His very life is in you. And the things of God over time, as you walk in the Spirit and exercise what you really want to do in your life, is going to bear resemblance to His heart and what He did. Watch this. He says, if you're led by the Spirit, verse 18, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. We could call these the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, robberies, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I love this part where he says, and things like these, kind of like there's a whole lot of stuff out there that's the fruit of the flesh, and I just can't say them all right now. I mean, that's kind of like what, he, what he's doing. And things like these, as if to say, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that when you look at these fruit of the flesh, and you think, well, thank God, I don't do any of those. And Paul says, and things like these probably stuff you're doing when you're in the flesh. Things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. Verse 2. The fruit of the Spirit. There's that word. First word. Out of the gate. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these, there is 
no law. All of these address what's inside of you long before they address what comes out of you. And the fruit of the Spirit is a benefit to you in your life first. And what's interesting about this is the text does not say the fruit of you. Because these are things you cannot produce in and of yourself. They're the fruit of who? doesn't say fruits of, but fruit of. Fruit of who? Fruit of the Spirit. Which means these are the things that the Spirit produces in and through your life. And when the fruit is coming out, you're just bearing it. You're not producing it. How many of you have ever said in your life, man, I need more patience. And you said, you know, this week, I am going to begin to demonstrate and to exhibit more patience in my life. And it seems like the demons of hell and the demons of impatience come against you and everything rails against you in your life and, and, and you can't be patient for the life of you because all week long you've been Focusing on what? You've been focusing on what? Trying to be more what? Being more patient. I need, to, I need to demonstrate more love or I need to demonstrate more joy. I need more self-control. And maybe you do. Maybe you do need these things in your life. Obviously, we all need these things in our life. Need more peace. More goodness. More gentleness. These things are good. But they're never produced in your life when you focus on these things. They're produced in your life when you're focused on the Spirit who gives you these things. It's really important. These things do not come about in our lives when we try to focus or try to manufacture these things. It's like man-made fruit. Man-made fruit might be plastic, it might be rubber, it might be ceramic at best. Do you know what I'm talking about when we talk about man-made fruit? It's that stuff that grandma puts on her table. And it's always ripe. And the banana's never brown, and the apple's never brown. But try taking a bite of one of grandma's man-made fruits. Not very nutritious. You'll probably have to go see a dentist after the experience. Or maybe a gastrologist. Because man-made fruit is hollow and always empty at best. It might impress from a distance. And somebody might say, wow, beautiful fruit on the table there. But these are not things that are produced by us in our lives we will not grow more patient or more gentle or have more self-control by trying to be more patient or gentle or have self-control. It will happen as we surrender to the Spirit's empowerment of our life because one of the primary purposes of a branch is to demonstrate the life-giving power of the vine. And the vine is here. Jesus. This is an invitation to Christ. And listen to what he says in verse 24 of Galatians 5. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then he says, if we live by the Spirit, and I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version, your translation or what we put in the screen will say, walk by the Spirit, but listen to this in the ESV. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So my goal, my goal, my goal, my role, my goal. My role is my goal. My goal is my role. What do I do in this thing? I simply keep in step with the Spirit. And if you keep in step with the Spirit, 
He will produce fruit in your life. You will bear it, but you will not produce it because it's the fruit of the Spirit. So time and time and time again, this is simply about keeping in step with the Spirit. Coming to Christ and just keeping up with Him. I love the expression, keep in step with the Spirit. Have you ever, went, have you ever gone somewhere with somebody who was a really fast walker? You ever been somewhere with someone who was a really fast walker? One of my mentors early on in ministry, actually one of my first bosses, in Murray, at the Corn and Austin Clothing Company, he was a fast walker. He began to help me to understand about work and having a work ethic. And he'd say to me, you got to walk fast, son. you got to walk fast, son, because people who walk fast have things to do. And I would try to keep up with him. And we'd go out in the farm. I'd work out there. We'd go in the store. We're there. He's always walking fast. One of my first mentors in ministry was a fast walker. I would go to him, go with him to Nashville, to the hospital, or Paducah. Places I'd never been before. As soon as he got out of the car, look at his split. He's in the elevator. If I did not walk fast, I would get run over in the street. It was a matter of life or death. The key was to keep in step. Keep in step. Keep in step. And there's times he walks fast and he says, go, and you go, and you run, and you go, and you don't think about it because the Spirit said go. And there's things he says, there's times he says, don't go, but whoa. Whoa. We need to take this slow. Sometimes he just says, sit right here for a minute and take this in. And he begins to move. And you just keep in step with the Spirit. Listen. This is really simple. You say, well, Brother Allen, isn't it so subjective? In regards to what you do or what you don't do? What may seem subjective to others is never subjective in the heart of the mind and the spirit. It's always objective in the heart of the mind and the spirit. It's always objective. It's always his leadership. It aligns with his heart, aligns with his mind. He goes. It's objective within him. It may seem subjective to you or other people, but it's always objective with him. And I also do not believe he would lead in a way that would be contrary to how he's led in the way of other people in Scripture or in regards to how other people have experienced him in life, but almost invariable, love is going to be part of the equation. So what's my role? First, I come to Christ. And then I can have peace that I abide in Him. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. And then, the rest of my life is to be characterized simply by keeping in step with the Spirit. And here's what I wholeheartedly believe. If we stay focused on Him, He takes care of all the rest. Can we all just do a big huge collective sigh here we go I've seen things in your life this week I've got something specifically in my mind that came across my phone this morning in regards to a picture saw this picture and I said in my spirit that's God God is all over that and then I saw where someone had taken the picture in a particular moment and I said God is all over that that person has no idea that they caught in that picture a true God moment of redemption reconciliation love 
kindness, goodness, generosity, self-control, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit were in this picture of two people who were simply embracing. And the, and the embrace had no idea that it was being caught on a camera. And the person behind the lens had no idea that they were capturing a moment of God. This stuff happens all the time. And it ministered to my spirit in regards to what I saw, in regards to what was being taken a picture of, and it ministered to my spirit in regards to who was behind the camera. And I just said, thank you, Jesus. You have no idea the extent to which God can use your life. And so many times the crowd is focusing on something and it's not that at all in regard to the things of God. Can I get it? And amen. So as you stand with us this morning.